Order, order. We start with questions to Secretary of State for Business and Trade. Peter Alders. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Number one. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please can I take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to pay tribute to Tony Lloyd. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I worked with him very closely on the All Party Group for Poverty and Fair Banking. He was a thoroughly decent man. Uh, on behalf of myself and the department, can we pass on our deep condolences to his friends and family? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The government works with the British Business Bank to improve access to finance for smaller businesses through targeted programmes such as the £12.4 billion of finance backing over 90,000 businesses across the UK, including £1 billion in start-up loans for 105,000 small businesses since 2012. Peter Alders. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I'm grateful to my hon. Friend for that reply. Many SMEs and new businesses who are finding it increasingly difficult to open a bank account and to then obtain the support and services that used to be available in the rapidly diminishing branch network. What steps is my honourable friend taking to address these challenges that SMEs are now facing? He raises a very important point, and leading banks and alternative lenders are committed to the SME Finance Charter to help small business and start-ups. We continue to work with UK finance and banking industry to ensure that SMEs have the support and banking services they require Many leading challenger banks, such as Metro, Aldermore or Starling, provide additional application support. And banking hubs, of course, are also available for those without a bank on their high street, offering face-to-face support. 30 have already opened, 70 more in the pipeline. Mr Speaker, can I thank the Minister for that excellent response? Uh, there is a willingness to meet net zero uh, uh, commitment from businesses all over the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So would the Minister be prepared to introduce a scheme whereby small businesses can access funding to implement infrastructure changes in their businesses to help them achieve net zero? And will this be available to all parts of this great United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland? Thank you. He raises a very important point, something we look at uh, all the time and certainly have had discussions. We already have programmes in place, including the, say, the £12.4 billion we distribute through British Business Bank that supports re- nations and regions' funds. Some of that will certainly help businesses access finance to decarbonise. We look at these measures all the time, of course, and we're very happy to work with him in future programmes that we might roll out. Senator Minister Tamsin Desi. Yeah. Yeah. Th- thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Small and medium enterprises are a vital part of a thriving global economy, yet 49% of British SMEs say they lack the time or the resources to sell internationally. They are being hindered, Mr. Speaker, by complex regulation, insufficient access to funding, and inadequate government guidance. And that's why Labour has launched the Small Business Exports Task Force with the, small, uh, the Federation of Small Businesses to listen to business needs and address them head on. So what is the Minister doing to uh, support hard-working SMEs navigate the government's complex web of regulatory requirements and help unleash this untapped entrepreneurial potential? Well, we agree with him on the ambition. He's probably just behind the game a little bit in terms of what we're actually doing, uh, not least in the 73 free trade agreements that we have agreed, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Not, uh, including the CPTPP that's, uh, that's coming down the tracks. I'm very hopeful they'll be supportive of it. He's probably obviously never also heard of the Export Support Service, so International yeah, Trade Advisors, yeah. Export Champions, all which help our SMEs export to other parts of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. George Perfect. <laughs> thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I take this opportunity to congratulate and thank the Secretary of State and the number two. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My Secretary of State was so savvy that she brought in a science minister and now under her stewardship, science and technology is booming in the Department for Business and Trade. The UK is the number one eco-tech uh, number one tech ecosystem in Europe, raising more VC than France and Germany combined. And you know, Science and tech is not just only fans, but we've now mainstreamed it with the Office for Investment, which is reaching out to companies around the world to highlight advantages of investing in the UK, bringing in over £5 billion of investment announced at the Global Investment Summit just last year. Thank you, Mr Speaker. You can see I'm using my freedom on the backbenches to improve my fitness and make myself as fit as the department. Could I take this opportunity to thank and congratulate the Secretary of State and the team at the Department of Business and Trade for the work they're doing, particularly in the Global Investment Summit. There is a wall of money out there globally to invest in UK science and tech, in life science, quantum fusion, agri-tech, 
and we're beginning, finally, to begin to attract that money. Could I ask what plans the Department has to make it easier for global investors to deploy money at scale in UK clusters? And my honourable friend will, will know m more than most, having had the brief previously. And of course, we are out there being able to source investment into the UK. As I mentioned, we're already beating France and Germany. And further afield, the UK is the third country behind the US and China to reach $1 trillion in value landmark. We've got the concierge service with the Office for Investment. We've also recently secured £4.5 billion pounds through the Advanced Manufacturing yeah, Plan. Yeah, yeah. That, coupled with the R&D budget, around £39.8 billion, and between 22 and 25, shows you that the UK is ready to enable investment in the UK and also to manufacture products that around this area too. Barry Shab. Mr Speaker, will the Secretary of State and the team pay much more attention to the science and innovation possibilities in the hydrogen sector, hydrogen energy and hydrogen power? This is something we're good at, the research is there, we need to be there quickly before the Chinese dominate the market. Thank you so much. I would gently say that the honourable gentleman should pay attention to the hydrogen strategy, which shows that we are leaning forward and ensuring that we are able to capture both the investment, also to de-risk um, any of the testing and ensuring that IP can be commercialised here in the UK too. We, of course, see hydrogen in the mix in our future energy spectrum. Christine Jolly. Question number three, please, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the Government has taken action to help SMEs deal with cost of living pressures, including free freezing fuel duty and maintaining the 5p cuts for the further year, the energy bills discount scheme, reversing the national insurance rise, and the autumn statement. The Chancellor announced a substantial business rate package to support the UK's small businesses worth £4.3 billion over the next five years. Christine Jarvie. Thank you very much. Notwithstanding uh, what the Minister says, I am still frequently being approached by small and medium enterprises in Edinburgh West who are struggling to meet soaring energy costs, stave off inflation and deal with Brexit red tape. The number of Scottish SMEs in financial distress is up 10 per cent, according to research. And these are formerly strong, stable, well-managed businesses. They have a huge impact on employment in tourism, which is one of our main industries. So, can the Minister tell me what more the Department will do to reassure businesses in my constituencies and elsewhere, and if he will be asking the Chancellor in the forthcoming budget to do more to help them? Well, she raises some very important points. Of course, the, the Chancellor could do nothing if the Scottish Government does not pass on the support we pass to Scotland which it hasn't done in terms of business rates. I know that's out of her hands, but it's a point she may want to re raise with the Scottish Government. She, the average pub in Scotland is £15,000 uh, a year worse off than their English counterparts because they have not passed through that rate of support. The average restaurant or guest house is £30,000 worse off than their English counterparts, and closure rates in Scotland are 30% higher than in England. Oh. Shadow Minister Rishanara, are they? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Business closures are now exceeding new business openings, with 345,000 businesses across the UK having closed since 20, in 2022, the highest since records began. And This week, the Financial Times reported that more than 47,000 businesses are on the verge of collapse. Former Prime Minister Johnson used an expletive to describe his party's commitment to business. His successor well and truly delivered on that commitment by crashing the economy. Isn't it time the government put businesses out of their misery and called for a general election so that the country can get back to business? Well, we are on this side of the House, we are for business because we are from business. We understand the needs of businesses. Are you, uh, oh, really? That's, that's an interesting point from there. He said from a sedentary position. Um, the, the actual numbers of closures, although, of course, we're concerned about increases, are below pre pandemic averages. But nevertheless, we have stepped in to help. For, as I said before, freezing fuel duty, maintaining the 5p cut, the £4.3 billion pounds of business rate support all to help our SMEs, and I say closure rates are lower in England than they are in whale, whale, uh, Labour-run Wales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Janet <laughs> Number four, please, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, the UK is a leading advocate for human rights around the world. When we have concerns on human rights, they are raised directly with partner governments, including at ministerial level, 
and including with India. Trade negotiations with India are continuing to build on our £38 billion trading relationship and get better access to 1.4 billion consumers. I thank the Minister for his answer, but an industry risk analysis data set shows that India ranks among the worst performing countries for human rights abuses across a host of key industries. So my question is a specific one, and I'd like an answer, please. Has the government consulted with human rights monitoring bodies and experts, and is the government actively considering the impact of this deal on human rights abuses in India? Well, Speaker, first of all, I congratulate her on her. Uh, um, <laughs> I congratulate her, first of all, on her recent election as chair of the Joint Committee on Human Rights. Uh, the UK engages regularly with the Indian government and indeed with other governments uh, around the world, bilaterally and multilaterally. Uh, Where we have concerns on human rights, we raise them directly with the partner government, including, as I said, at ministerial level. Um, Can I just say, though, that I'm not entirely sure, Mr Speaker, that whatever we do on human rights will make any difference to whether the SNP will support this trade deal or not. Not only fans of FTAs have noticed, Mr Speaker, we've all noticed that the SNP have never supported any trade deal ever negotiated by either the EU or by the UK, Mr Speaker. They've abstained on Japan, abstained on Singapore, they've been against Canada, against Australia, against Korea, and even against Ukraine. Don't don't tempt me, you're doing well. Richard Thompson, I said baseball. Thank thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to give the Minister another chance, because that was pretty dismal stuff, even by his standards. India is one of the countries in the world with the the poorest record in human rights when it comes to child labour. So, to give the Minister an opportunity to help us maybe get to a position where we could potentially support a deal, can he explain how Ministers and the Government are engaging with negotiators in India to try and tackle child labour in India and to make sure that the United Kingdom does not become complicit in that exploitation? Uh, Well, Mr Speaker, um, of course the UK has got a very proud record on uh, labour standards, a very proud record on raising these issues uh, with counterparts uh, at all levels. Uh, Lord Ahmed was in India recently, just a couple of weeks ago, raising uh, specific human rights uh, issues, uh, including a case uh, which uh, the SNP have raised on frequent occasions. The government is proud of its record on labour protections and have been clear that an FTA with India does not come at the expense of labour standards. But can I just refer him back, if you like, to the rhetorical question, Mr Speaker? When is the SNP ever going to support a trade deal Minister, with anybody? Minister, Minister, you know that's not the response. Responsibility of you to ask the question. It's for others to ask you the questions. Come on, you know better than that as an ex-chair of the Conservative Party. Come on, Sir Michael. I'm going to ask question five. <laughs> and I will answer question five with no question eighteen, with your permission, Mr. Speaker. Um, more than fifteen percent of global shipping tariff passes through the Red Sea, making it one of the most important strategic waterways in the world. Overall, a whopping 12% of global trade volumes uses this trade route, and my department is monitoring the impacts of the events in the Red Sea closely, as previously as the shipping minister and now as the minister for advanced manufacturing. This is very important to industry. We are working to equip UK businesses with the tools that they need to deal with global supply chain issues. Just last week, I published the world's first ever critical imports and supply chain strategy, the world's first, in collaboration with industry. The strategy includes making the UK Government the centre of excellence for supply chain analysis and risk assessment, supporting our status Mr. Speaker, as the world's eighth largest manufacturer. This will help UK business build secure and reliable supply chains vital to the UK's economy, national security and the delivery of our essential services. I'm sure it doesn't need to ask a question with what you read out. Come on, Sir Michael. Think of one, Mr. T- Mr. Speaker. So, as uh, my honourable friend has said, we're the eighth largest manufacturer in the world. And where is the centre of manufacturing? It is, of course, the West Midlands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What advice is my honourable friend giving to people like Andy Street, for example, oh. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, about what can be done to support yeah. businesses in the West Midlands overcome what I hope is a temporary difficulty? My honourable friend has hit so many markers in that, in that question. Absolutely.
absolutely right that the West Midlands, and Birmingham in particular, is the heart of advanced manufacturing. I would suggest that the Mayor catches up on the supply chain report. I'm more than happy to sit down and talk to him about that. We have worked in industry, including the automotive sector, to ensure that their supply chains can be as flexible and resilient as they can be. Of course, there are concerns about extended routes from that part of the world into Europe, but uniquely, as I mentioned earlier, we are the first country in the world to produce a, a strategy working with industry, ensuring that the UK continues to provide the data they need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At a time when we're beginning to see inflation fall, recent developments in the Red Sea are extremely concerning, not just in terms of security, but it's hugely costly, costly to shipping too. My constituents do not want to see an increase in prices as a result of these terror attacks. Can she build on the excellent answer she gave to my honourable friend, the member for Lichfield, in reassuring businesses in my constituency that we'll do all we can to main fl- maintain the flow of goods to and from the UK? Um, Absolutely. The UK will always stand up for the freedom of navigation and free flow of trade, and we take threats to shipping vessels in the Red Sea extremely seriously. She's absolutely right to note that there's been an increase in cost potential fundamentally in in rates, 124% increase in freight rates, which is why we've produced a strategy and we'll have a council which will continue to work with industry to make sure the supply chains are resilient and have the least amount of impact on our economy. Jeremy Stutt. Number six, please, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Government provides extensive business support for all businesses, including those in rural areas. And as a Member of Parliament for a rural constituency, I am very keenly aware of the difficulties uh, specifically that apply to those rural businesses, particularly because of their location. Uh, So we focus with other departments on access to energy. We work with DfE on apprenticeships. But we also have the Business Bank's Recovery Loan Scheme and the Startup Loans Company improves access to finance to help businesses invest and grow. And I do believe that 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 package helps rural businesses. Jeremy Still. Mr Speaker, I thank the Secretary of State for her answer. The Secretary of State will, will be aware that the Sutherland Spaceport could be a fantastic boost for local businesses. Equally, floating offshore wind in the North Sea presents opportunities for Wick and Scrabs to Harbours. And yet, to underpin this, we need the transport infrastructure. The uh, public service obligation for Wick Airport runs out in March of this year, and there's been no word from the Scottish Government as to whether that would be continued. This would be a fatal blow. And the abject failure to invest in the A9, promises after promises after promises, broken. What advice does the Secretary of State have for me? I would ask him to speak to the SNP-led Scottish Government because they are responsible for much of this investment. It is, uh, it is a real shame that the SNP Government doesn't care about uh, rural businesses or small businesses in Scotland. If we look at figures from the ONS, they show Scotland lost more than 20,000 businesses last year, and it's mainly the smallest businesses employing up to 50 people. But I take the point that he has made about uh, infrastructure. This is something that we have to look at on a UK-wide basis, and I'm prepared to look a little bit in more detail at what my department can do to support Dr. Therese Coffey. Mr. Speaker, I think my right honourable friend is doing a great job for rural businesses. There is an aspect, though, uh, where the Met Office, which is under uh, her uh, stewardship, um, is responsible for providing wind forecasts. This is particularly important as the Orwell Bridge was recently closed. I would like to see more transparency, but also for the Met Office to publish very specifically the wind speed on their app so that there is transparency for all of business so that the bridge is not closed unnecessarily. I thank my right honourable friend for her question. Uh, this, is, uh, this does sound like a significant issue. I am uh, pleased to say that the Met Office is not under my uh, department. It is the, uh, it's his DCIT, but this is something that we can raise with colleagues in this DCIT to make sure that they can look at it uh, as quickly as possible. Rob Roberts. Seven, please. <clears throat> Mr Speaker, I meet regularly with ministers from the devolved administrations through inter-ministerial fora to discuss a range of policy issues. SMEs across Wales have access to a range of UK government services to help them to grow and to thrive. The UK government also recently announced that it will be appointing new international trade advisers in Wales to provide tailored support for Welsh SME exporters to take advantage of new export opportunities. Rob Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Labour Welsh Government is reducing rate relief for the hospitality sector from 75% to 40% in April. Yeah. Following this announcement, Monmouthshire County Council, which is also Labour-run, called on their colleagues to maintain support at the same rate as it is in England. 
Business owners have criticised the Welsh Government, saying that it would be deeply unfair, but the outgoing First Minister has rejected their calls and a number of hospitality businesses have already closed their doors this year. Will the Minister join me in urging the Welsh Government to maintain the 75% of support businesses uh, necessarily need, instead of cutting their feet from under them just because Welsh Labour can't manage a budget? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I think the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right. The Welsh Labour Government needs to start supporting businesses and maintain the 75% relief rate as we do in England. The Welsh Government Mr Speaker, has also cut the budget of Business Wales from £26.6 million to £21 million. Figures from UK Hospitality show that the average pub in Wales will be £6,800 £6, worse off as a result compared to England. The average restaurant, £12,000. The average hotel, £20,000. I don't know, Mr Speaker, who will be in charge of Labour in Wales, but it's about time they started backing Welsh business as the UK Government does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Philip Number eight, sir. Mr Speaker, uh, the Department for Business and Trade has done a lot to bring foreign direct investment into the UK. Just last November, we raised £30 billion at our Global Investment Summit. Uh, specifically for North Northamptonshire, uh, uh, my honourable friend will be pleased to know that his constituents can take advantage of the DBT national and regional investment teams uh, who work with local partners to provide support for foreign investors who wish to invest and set up in the region. Philip Hollowbell. Inward investment into the Kettering constituency includes all cooperation of the US, building Europe's largest and most modern aluminium drinks can manufacturing plant in Burton Latimer, creating 200 new jobs. Will my right honourable friend congratulate and thank Ball for its confidence and investment in North Northamptonshire's manufacturing economy and encourage others to see Kettering with its superb connectivity and motivated workforce? as an ideal location for further investment. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely pleased to be able to say that, and I would like to congratulate and thank Ball Corporation for placing their investment in Kettering. This is exactly the sort of investment that we want to see all around the UK. This is the levelling up agenda writ large. And I would also like to thank all of the officials in my department, but especially my ministers who travel all across the world, including to the, UK, uh, to the US, promoting the UK. We never talk this country down. We let people know that this is a place that is great to do business, and we are seeing the benefits of that strategy. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, number nine. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, on the 10th of January, <coughs> we announced the government's intention to bring forward legislation within weeks to overturn the convictions of all those convicted in England or Wales on the basis of post office evidence during the Horizon scandal. I met with the Justice Secretary only this week to make sure those plans are on track, and we hope to bring forward that legislation as soon as possible. Jeff Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Does the Minister have an estimate of how many convictions were made from the uh, Horizon pilot, and can he confirm that those convictions made during the Horizon pilot will be included in the legislation, given that they weren't made during, uh, using Horizon data? Uh, we don't know the actual number of that yet. We are very concerned about people potentially who were subject to similar abuses, uh, who used the pilot version of Horizon. We do believe they fall under similar compensation schemes, and there is no reason why they wouldn't be covered under, under the overturning of, convic of convictions legislation. So David Davis. For the legislation to work, postmasters have to come forward. When I asked one of my constituents this weekend why they had not come to me sooner, they said obviously the NDA that they sign, but also that they'd had to sign the Official Secrets Act. I thought this was so bonkers I didn't believe it, until I read page 26 of Dick Wallace's <coughs> book, which says they do have to sign the Official Secrets Act. Now, if this mad policy is still going on, can he bring it to an end? And can he tell postmasters all over the country they are completely at liberty to talk to their MPs about any aspect of the post office? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, can I thank him for his question and all the work he's done in this area? Um, I understand the requirement to sign the Official Secrets Act relates to the confidentiality of mail. It is do does not relate to the confidentiality of issues regarding mistreatment by their own post, by the post Office Limited. So he's absolutely right to raise this point, and I will certainly raise it with Post Office Limited. And, um, but yes, I can confirm that would not stop somebody from speaking out, including to their Member of Parliament. So Secretary of State Jonathan Reynolds. Yeah. Yeah. Grateful, Mr Speaker. The Minister knows we're willing to work with the Government. 
on a way to exonerate the sub-postmasters and get them the compensation as quickly as possible. Now, we know the pr proposals will have to be imperfect, but they do represent a clear option to resolving this terrible issue. As a way of ensuring safeguards against any potential future misuse of this precedent, could cross-party agreement be established as an essential provision of exercising powers of this kind? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I thank you for his question and the constructive way he has engaged with us on this particular issue. I know the Justice Secretary sp spoke to the Leader of the Opposition this week on this very matter, and uh, we are very keen to engage with him. He is right to say the solution is imperfect. We believe it is the least worst option, but of course we will engage with him and make sure he uh, feels the legislation is in the right place. Jonathan Reynolds. I am grateful uh, to the Minister for the answer, and I hope that exchanges of some reassurance to all colleagues in the House today. Could I also ask him to confirm that all prosecutions that arise from the Horizon pilot scheme will now also be included in these exonerations, given they were technically prosecuted without official Horizon data, but it is very much the same as you? Yeah. Well, again, he raised a very uh, important point. It was a similar point that was raised earlier. We feel the circumstances were similar, so that we would feel there is no reason to exclude those people who have been convicted in similar circumstances. An issue, again, I am very happy to work with him on. Daniel Zeitner. Number 10, please, Mr Speaker. <coughs> uh, Mr Speaker, this Government is committed to breaking down barriers to trade through our ambitious programme of free trade agreements. Uh, also, in August last year, the Government announced the Border Target Operating Model, which will simplify border processes for both imports and exports. Uh, these changes, based on smarter use of data and technology, will put in place new security and biosecurity controls whilst ensuring they are as simple as possible for businesses to comply with. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And, uh, indeed, those five times delayed border checks are coming into effect very soon, but those dealing with plant and animal health products are, are seriously worried about potential delays. Indeed, the Chair of the Horticultural Trade Association has pointed out the process of importing a petunia, a petunia from the Netherlands has already increased from 19 to 59 steps, and he warns the new border is a disaster waiting to happen. So, what is the Minister doing to ensure that we will have a plentiful supply of imported red roses for Valentine's Day, especially for all those Conservatives on, on the other side who love each other so much? <laughs> Well, Mr Speaker, I'm feeling his love this morning. Thank you. Um, can I just say, Mr Speaker, we have consulted very widely on the border target operating model. Um, we've spent put a lot of time and effort and a lot of consultation. We've been running webinars. We've been putting out leaflets uh, to make sure that businesses are aware. And the introduction of this, of course, will be staged. Uh, but, Mr Speaker, I think what he needs to be careful on is what Labour's plan will be, because this week, the EU ambassador to, to London revealed the fact that Labour's desire for a uh, food and veterinary agreement is likely to lead to closer dynamic alignment between London and Brussels in the future, which, Mr Speaker, is directly against his party leader's stated policy of no dynamic alignment. Joe Gideon. Speaker, number 11. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, with your permission, I will answer question 11 and 12 together. Over £153 million has been paid to 2,700 victims. We encourage anyone impacted to use the three compensation schemes available. We have already published the details of the upfront £75,000 fixed sum offer for GLO postmasters on the gov.uk website, created a new claim form, and have written to all eligible members of the GLO scheme to explain the offer further. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the post office horizon scandal has shocked the nation. My constituent, Kim Ledgar, received a settlement <coughs> under the historic shortfall scheme, which did not take into account the enormous stress, extra work trying to balance the books, damage to her reputation and the price she and her family paid uh, in lost income, having had to make up the shortfall herself. Uh, does the Minister agree with me that we need to acknowledge the wider cost of the post office's appalling behaviour? And will the Minister meet with me to discuss how those accepted, who accepted an offer under the historical <laughs> shortfall scheme may now receive compensation, which truly reflects the impact that the conduct of the post office over two decades has had on their lives? Um, well, can I thank you for a question, and can I apologise on behalf of the Government for, to, to uh, Kim Ledger for what she's been through? 
Absolutely, it is our intention that everybody gets full and fair compensation, and that is for financial losses, but also for non-pecuniary losses. Uh, we have taken a number of steps to help ensure the compensation is fair and delivered swiftly, including establishing the independent advisory board with the noble Lord Abuthnut, who sits on that particular board. We will continue to work with the board and consider what further action is required. But yes, of course, I would be very happy to meet with my honourable friends to discuss these matters further. Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Post Office Horizon scandal has made it clear to all of us what happens when whistleblowers are ignored or silenced. As well as ensuring that victims are properly compensated, would my honourable friend agree with me that we need better legislation to protect whistleblowers? And as the government's whistleblowing frame framework review draws to a close, will you meet with me to discuss how the outcome of the review can be used to support the whistleblowing bill that I presented yesterday in this House? Well, can I thank her for all the work? We, we were at one point co-chairs of the whole party group on whistleblowing, and she does a, a tremendous job in raising this point time and time again in this House, of course. Yes, of course, I will meet with her. We are currently reviewing the effectiveness of the whistleblowing framework and meeting its intended objectives. Every single scandal I have, been, uh, I have talked about in this House over the years, from the back benches and the front benches, has come to light because of whistleblowers. Hugely important. Uh, we are reviewing that framework. The research for the review is near completion. And the government will set out the next steps in due course. But yes, of course, I would be very happy to meet her to discuss that. Kerry McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I too have a constituent who thankfully was not prosecuted, but over a period of more than a decade she was forced to pay back thousands of pounds every year, so it amounts to a six figure sum. But as the member for Stoke and Trent Central said, it is not just about that pecuniary loss, it is about the impact on her family. And I won't go into her personal details here, but it took a, a real hit. And I, I just wish that she would come forward to me sooner, but I did meet with her um, a couple of weeks ago, and it really has wrecked her life. So again, I would ask what support. And she hasn't had any compensation yet through the shortfall scheme. So can I urge him to make sure that people like that are properly compensated? Well, she's absolutely right to raise this, this point. Yes, the compensation scheme is there to, uh, to compensate or provide redress for financial loss, but also for personal loss, loss of reputation, impact on health, uh, those kind of matters. Quite rightly, they do too. There are two routes to open to compensation. Uh, the £75,000 fixed sum award, which is pretty much an immediate payment, or you can go for full assessment of losses, which takes into account all those matters, of course. Interim payments are also available. We've paid out £153 million in total across the schemes. Very happy to help her with a specific case, and we're looking, of course, to try and expedite payment of these of compensation, full and fair compensation, to all individuals, and I'm working on a daily basis to try and do that. Let me Abraham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, number, uh, number 13. You Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the government is committed to tackling late payments. That's why uh, we launched the Cash Flow and Prompt Payment Policy Review, um, which was published alongside the autumn statements. This uh, review includes uh, amending payment performance reporting requirements for large businesses and providing the Small Business Commissioner with more powers to investigate late payments. Debbie Abraham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy, but unfortunately, late payments are continuing to blight the ability of small businesses to trade, um, with an average of £684 million a year being lost. And unfortunately, this is on the increase, 7% increase in, uh, in 2023. So I appreciate what uh, the Minister said about another review. I think we had one uh, a few years ago. What specific actions is government taking um, to actually address this appalling abuse of power, which is contributing to 50,000 small businesses going under a year? Well, she's absolutely right to raise it. With the specific actions I set out earlier, giving the Small Business Commissioner more powers, of course, producing league tables. We work very closely with Good Business Pays, who produce league tables on this issue. So, naming the shaming of the people responsible are important. The government's leading the way as well, of course. From April 2024, firms bidding for government contracts over £5 million will have to demonstrate they pay their own invoices within an average of 55 days tightening to 45 days in April 2025 and to 30 days in the coming years. Simkin. 14, please. Sir. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Chancellor and I meet regularly, and obviously we know and recognise the importance of the steel sector in the UK economy. Our commitment to the sector is clear. We have invested, will be investing over £500 million into the Port Talbot site to ensure that steelmaking continues in the UK. Without that investment, the 8,000 jobs at the port and the 12,500 jobs in the supply chain would have been at risk. We are working with Tata and we have set up a transition board that the Honourable Member knows about because we both sit on it and we provided over £100 million of support for affected employees and the local economy. And Tata also announced on Friday, last Friday they provide an additional £130 million pounds of support for employees facing redundancy. The option, Mr Speaker, was still making no longer continuing at Port Talbot or the investment that we have provided. Well, in Sorry, Simkin. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <sir. laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So, so ministers keep uh, spinning this line that Tata Steel was threatening to close down the Port Talbot works and walk away, but they know that that's an empty bluff because the costs of dismantling and remediating the Patalbot steelworks were vast and utterly uh, prohibitive. So uh, against that backdrop, let, let's be clear, I, is it the case that there were no strings attached whatsoever to the £500 million of taxpayers' money that has been given to Tata Steel, and that that £500 million was given by the Prime Minister to Tata Steel, along with a green light to make 2,800 steelworkers redundant? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I, I wouldn't want steel workers to think that we aren't working together, and the Honourable uh, Member and I work together on, and will be working together on ensuring that steel workers are protected as much as they can. So I, I, I think it's extraordinary that the position he is now putting forward is that it would have been better to risk the loss of, of absolute steel making in the UK than allow the taxpayer to pick up the cost to manage the site. And I believe it is far more preferential that we made the largest investment ever in steelmaking to protect over 5,000 jobs at Port Talbot and the 12,500 jobs in the supply chain. And fundamentally, we oh, have. Oh, oh, order. Just, just, just one Sorry. second. No, no. It might be better that that conversation is carried on outside rather than c coming across the benches while the minister's replying. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At the heart of our decision was two things. Continued steel making at Port Talbot and protecting steel workers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've recently heard from my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Defence, how the West is facing a pre war world. So, will the Minister ensure in her conversations with Treasury that they understand the vital strategic importance yeah, yeah. of a virgin steel making capability here in the UK? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know that my, um, uh, my honourable friend is, uh, uh, has a huge amount of knowledge not only for the steel sector, but as a huge um, champion for Scunthorpe too. She knows that we are working incredibly hard with um, the company within her constituency, and we are waiting for them to respond to their business plans going forward. We know how important virgin steel making is, and we also now accept, because technology has moved on, that 90% of all steel can now be made in electric arc furnaces as well going forward. Sarah Jell, Shadow Minister. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The UK steel industry, the trade unions and the Labour Party are proposing an industrial policy worthy of a serious industrial country. That's not my words, Mr Speaker. Not my words, but the World Economic Editor of the Daily Telegraph, writing yesterday. He also says... The government's minimalist plan does half the job, yeah. leaving the UK with a stunted second-tier industrial base, yeah. the only G20 country lacking a sovereign capability in weapons-grade yeah. primary steel. He's right, isn't he? Yeah. 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 Uh, speaker, the £28 billion pounds that they're proposing has no plan behind it, yeah. and we're not told what we're going to pay for it. Hard workers across the country to fill that black hole. Yeah. The party opposite have asked for a transition to green steel. The party opposite would want us to protect steel workers and obviously wanted to protect advanced manufacturing in the UK. Customers want cleaner steel. Port Talbot could no longer function with its ageing arc furnaces, and our package will be saving 5,000 jobs at Port Talbot. Rachel Maskell. Good morning. Number 15, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> um, I met him this week. With, uh, the, uh, I spoke to the uh, conference attended by building societies on uh, how we increase presence on the high street in terms of things like access to cash and finance facilities. The government provides extensive business support for all businesses, including uh, social enterprises and cooperatives. The British Business Bank's Recovery Loan Scheme or the Startup Loans Company improve access to finance to help those kind of businesses invest and grow. Master. Thank you. Cooperatives and social enterprise businesses provide a fairer way of doing businesses, involve members in greater um, business decisions and also provide economic growth for local areas. However, they are being held back by financial and regulatory constraints. So, Will the Government match the Labour Party and Cooperative Party's ambition of committing to address these challenges and doubling the size of the cooperative sector? Yeah. Well, personally, I'm a very big fan of cooperative movements, and I'm a big fan of the regional mutual bank system in, in Germany. I've spoken about that many times in this place. So, um, um, of course, the government supported the Cooperative Mutual Friendly Societies Act uh, last year, which helps to maintain the status of cooperatives. Uh, social enterprises and cooperatives can also access support via the Business Support Helpline, helps your website, and through our network of local growth hubs. Number 16, sir. Mr Speaker, at the autumn statement, we announced the decision to extend the growth duty to Ofgem, Ofwat and Ofcom, alongside a series of reforms to the duty to hold regulators to account for delivering growth in the sectors they regulate. We are also currently consulting on proposals to strengthen the economic regulation of the energy, water and telecom sectors. Reg Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am grateful to the Secretary of State for that answer, but on regulatory reform through retained EU law reform from the June to December 23 reporting period, there were only two regulatory reforms of note around wine marketing and working time calculations, the rest technical corrections. So what steps is my right hon. Friend taking to speed up reform of retained EU law to ensure regulation works for business and enables growth? Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I'm very glad that my, right, uh, my, my honourable friend read the report which I sent out this week on what we had been doing. Yeah. No. However, um, no. I do disagree that only two reforms of note have been delivered. We've repealed or reformed over 2,000 pieces. The Port Services Regulations is, uh, is an example that were not designed for UK ports in mind. We passed the Financial Services uh, and Markets Act, we passed the Procurement Act. So I just want to remind him that that list is actually just what we are using the schedule for. There are many other mechanisms within the retained EU law programme in order to deliver uh, on that roadmap uh, for improving our economy and making it more competitive by making sure our laws are tailored to our economy. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In support of economic growth, the Right Honourable Member for South West Norfolk cut £235 million from environment agency budgets when at DEFRA. Rather than bringing economic growth, what that served to do was to bring sewage growth. Sewage discharges doubled between the period 2016 to 2021. I'm delighted to hear yesterday that the Government is going to adopt my water quality monitoring bill. But will it also restore some of the funding to the environment agency that was cut to bring back powers as well as duties? Uh, a spending review will be coming up shortly where we can look, look at these things, but I really have to challenge many of the things the Honourable Gentleman has said. It is a misrepresentation that the issues that are going on with sewage are to do with the actions of the uh, Right Honourable Member for South, Nor uh, South West Norfolk. The fact of the matter is that this Government is the one that has been taking the reforms through the Environment Act to improve a situation that has been the case throughout multiple governments, including the one which his party, the Liberal Democrats, yeah. participated in during the coalition. So it is very wrong to make that case. Yeah. Right, we now come to topicals. Oh, this is Carmichael. Number one, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, as Secretary of State for Business and Trade, I'm committed to ensuring the resilience of the UK's critical supply chains. Last week, this government published the Critical Imports and Supply Chain Strategy to help UK businesses build secure and reliable supply chains. Our 18-point action plan will help businesses to deal better with global supply chain issues, from overcoming bureaucratic barriers to dealing with severe shocks caused by events like the pandemic, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine and the attacks in the Red Sea that have threatened a key route for global trade. DBT led the development of this strategy. It was shaped by the experiences of UK businesses, and I was delighted that representatives of the industry, as well as key international partners, joined us at the strategy's launch at Heathrow Airport, which is, of course, the UK's largest import hub by value. Mr. Carmichael. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker, and wish you and the rest of the House a happy Burns Night for this evening. And on that theme, is it not a scandal that the only way you can get the great chieftain of the pudden race imported, <laughs> exported into the United States is if you send the vegetarian version? Oh, is this shocked. not something that the Secretary of State could actually put into her 18-point action plan and get on and do something, or does she want to risk forever being known as a cowering, timorous beastie? Oh. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his very esoteric question. What I would say in terms of, uh, what I would say in terms of U- US and UK trade is that we are continually removing barriers. We are trading more with the US than ever before. If he has a specific example which I can help him with so he can enjoy his Burns night, I would appreciate it if he wrote to me and we can look at the matter in detail. Duncan Baker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With so many banks closing on our high streets, the post office is picking up so much of the slack. But in rural areas, the limits that are placed on the post office in terms of the amount of cash that can be paid in is having a real impact on those rural businesses. Think of pubs, for instance. Lots of cash being paid in, but they can't because of the limits. Can the Minister carry out a review of this and ensure that the post office can take far greater volumes of cash to help our rural businesses? Yeah, yeah. Minister. Well, can I thank him for his work on this particular point? We hear I've discussed this on many occasions. These limits relate to money laundering, to try and prevent money laundering, but it's important those checks are proportionate. I have um, t- raised this on a number of occasions with the Financial Conduct Authority in terms of the impact and with UK Finance. There, are, there is more transparency now that is working more effectively. I know from my personal experience the wonderful Ingham's Fish and Chip Shop in Firely has experienced less problems now when it pays money into, into its uh, local post office. And of course this is a great opportunity as well as for Ingham's Fish and Chip Shop for the, um, for the post office network in terms of the banking framework and making that relationship more, lu- more lucrative. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Postal workers are the bedrock of our communities, but they are being forced to work at unsustainable levels, something that sadly hasn't been recognised in Ofcom's report on the future of universal service obligations. Postal workers' input is critical for a successful Royal Mail moving forward, so can we have confirmation, please, that their views will be considered in any future decisions? Well, that would make for perfect sense, and of course, we read the Ofcom report with interest in, in terms of looking at the review of the universal service obligation. It is absolutely our clear position that we will maintain a six-day uh, service across the, uh, for our citizens and businesses. But of course, those views should certainly be taken into account. The Secretary of State has, has often stated her support for post-Brexit regulatory reform and divergence again this morning in answer to to an earlier question. So is she in a position to deny reports in The Telegraph today that the Government has pledged to introduce a requirement that all future regulatory law change will be screened to ensure that they don't create extra trade barriers in the IRC? Because that could be a significant impediment in the way of divergence from EU laws. Speaker, I thank my right honourable friend for that question. I can't, of course, comment on the uh, Northern Ireland political process which is ongoing and which I am not a participant to. However, what I will say is that we retain the ability to diverge. That is clear. And I do agree with her that if we are really to seize the benefits of Brexit, we need to find that comparative advantage in our regulations with the EU. Otherwise, there would be no point. And uh, I would remind her that I was the business secretary who made sure there was transparency in what we were doing around EU regulations rather than an invisible bond fire. I was the one who ended the jurisdiction of the European Court on 1st of January, and we do have a comprehensive deregulation programme which I'm pushing. I do understand her concerns. I will speak to colleagues across uh, departments and make sure that they are raised at the highest level. Yeah. SMP spokesperson Richard Thompson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Secretary of State please confirm for me that this Government has no plans to alter the legislation currently surrounding the marketing of infant formula milk and other breast milk substitutes? Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you raise a very interesting point. I'm very happy to talk to him and possibly write to him later on that particular point. Scott Benton. Mr. Speaker, Royal Mail customers will have welcomed the Minister's reassurances this week in ruling out a reduction 
to the current six day per week service. However, many customers already feel shortchanged by what is already an inadequate service in many occasions in their particular area. Will the Minister agree that any proposed changes need to protect the small businesses whose business model relies on the six day week service and the rights of customers? He's absolutely right to raise this. The service has not been satisfactory. Uh, they've been fined £5.6 million by Ofcom as a result of that. They have employed 3,000 more postal workers to try to address those problems. We are seeing some improvement, but he's right to raise the point about our postal service, our six day service being vital for businesses, yeah, yeah, particularly yeah. those in the magazine and greeting yeah. cards industries. Yeah, yeah. Peter Dahl. <clears throat> what assessment has the Minister made <clears throat> of the results of private sector trials in relation to the introduction? of a four-day week, and will he meet with me in due course to discuss the results of those trials? Uh, okay, thank you for this question. Um, it is uh, clearly up to businesses themselves if they decide to uh, trial a four-day week. We've, we've made no assessment of the results of that. It is our belief that we shouldn't run a Stalinist economy where we tell private sector businesses how to operate their, uh, their workforce and how their, their days of the week. He may differ on that particular perspective, but we have introduced important reforms that do help businesses work more flexibly, including the flexible working changes that we recently introduced. Dame Caroline Dyer. Mr Speaker, the Gosport branch of ASDA is the first in the UK to ballot for strike action. Employees cite issues including low staffing levels, health and safety issues and delayed equal pay claims. Considering ASDA's importance to the UK food chain and employment across the country, what powers does the Minister have to ensure that both workers and consumers are protected? Well, she raised a very interesting point. We've looked at this uh, with, uh, with interest in terms of this particular um, situation, and we'll continue to monitor it. Clearly, this, uh, um, ASDA is a private company, and the, it's up to them to decide how best to deploy their workforce. But I'm very happy to continue to our, our conversation about it, and I appreciate her engagement on this particular issue. Mr. Johnny. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. A lot of um, concern has already been expressed in this House this week about the steel industry, but with the expansion of uh, renewables across Scotland and the rest of the UK, there is going to be a demand for the vital materials required to build more wind turbines, which may now need to be sourced from abroad. So can the Secretary of State tell us what steps are going to be taken to try and provide these vital materials for an important industry? I, I, I think it is really important for us to not misrepresent what is happening around steel. Our steel industry is not disappearing. Our steel industry is evolving. We will continue to have significant steel making capability in the UK, and that includes producing materials for those industries which you talked about. But we should also remember that the changes to Port Talbot are part of the decarbonisation that all of the people on that side of the House have been asking for. This is something that it, this is the single biggest emitter of carbon in the UK. This House voted to uh, reduce net zero by 2050, and everything we are doing is to make sure that we do this in a sustainable and sensible way. Martin Vickers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I follow on from my honourable friend from Scunthorpe's question earlier? For the sake of clarity, could the uh, Secretary of State confirm that it, it remains the Government's position to ensure that the UK has uh, the capacity to produce virgin steel here in the UK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Government has maintained that we want to make sure that we keep steel making capability in the UK. At the moment, we import ore to make steel. So when we talk about virgin steel, we, many people assume that there are no imports that come into the supply chain. There still are even now, and whatever changes we make will require uh, some imports. However, we are making sure that our steel industry is more resilient than ever before at a time when it is facing oversupply from China and from India. That is the real problem that the steel industry in all of Western Europe is facing. We do a lot with uh, uh, tariff measures like steel safeguards, so there is a lot that we are doing to help resolve this issue. Please, don't do that. I call the next member. I expect to sit down. Let me Abrahams. It's topical. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the Post Office Minister meet with me and my constituent? Um, she, she was a, a postmistress. She lost £250,000 uh, in 2000. It is an unusual case, otherwise, I would write him, but it does need him to, to meet with the wife. So I'd be grateful if he would do that. Minister. 
Yes, I'd be very happy to meet. The compensation schemes are, there are three different compensation schemes. It depends which one she falls into. If it's the GLO, there's an immediate award of £75,000 that can be made. If it's an overturned conviction, it's £600,000. Well, I'm sure there'll be one scheme her constituent will fit in. I'm very happy to meet to, to help uh, make sure she finds the right one. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mining is coming back to Cornwall, and uh, this week I met with uh, industry leaders from around the uh, country uh, at a roundtable here in the Commons to talk about the challenges that the critical minerals industry is facing as chair of the all-party group. Uh, will the minister agree to come to a future meeting to discuss some of the challenges that the industry is facing? Demand is going up exponentially, but they have tr um, it is a high-risk industry and they need your help. My right humble friend is a, a powerful leader of the All Party Group and obviously securing investment in mining into Cornwall as well, in particular lithium, which is going to be critical for our batteries in our cars. Absolutely agree to um, be interrogated at the All Party Parliamentary Group and I congratulate my right humble friend for securing investment in Cornwall. Dr. Rupert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could ministers fix the <coughs> logical loophole faced by Pixie Pixel lighting and camera hire in Acton? They supplied the first two series of the popular ITV drama. No, not that one. Uh, Grace, which is set in Brighton, but because of, because of, yeah, because of the um, Ofcom rules about having regional spend imposed on public service broadcasters, they've been banned and gazumped by a company in Manchester. Can you sort this out? Because it's, pun it's punitive on businesses in the M25. Please, Minister Duke Abancy, I don't want you doing the unsubtler sense. I, I believe this might be an issue for, uh, the, for DSED, but if she writes to me, we can look at this specific case. Thank you. Joe Gidd. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm grateful to the Business uh, Minister for working with me on the issue of button battery safety and the ongoing commitment of the five work streams to look at the issues. These were set up in 2022 following the tragic death of one of my constituents, Harper Lee Famthorpe, and the, the campaign for Harper Lee's Law. Will the Minister meet with me to discuss progress, in particular how the OPSS guidelines can be made compulsory so that future deaths and injuries from button battery ingestion can be prevented? Well, she's done a fantastic job on this campaign and made huge progress, significant progress in terms of making sure best practice is followed by suppliers. But yes, of course, very happy to meet with her to see what more can be done. Kenny McCaskill. At Ferguson Marine, the last shipyard in the Lawyer Clyde stands threatened as current work is concluded. It badly requires the order from Carmack for the seven small isles ferries. Now, the issue for procurement is with the Scottish Government and their agencies. But will the Minister ensure? that no impediment, no obstacle and no rules are under her control will stop the order being given directly by the Scottish Government to Ferguson Marine if they so wish. Mr Speaker, I am more than happy to sit down with the Honourable Member to discuss further on this case, but he opened the question with the, the most overriding fact. The decision sits with the Scottish Government here in the UK. We have an office for shipbuilding which has a wraparound service not only to secure contracts but ensure that ships are built in the UK shipyards. Hello, Morgan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Importers of short life items in North Shropshire, such as seed potatoes or chilled equine semen, are very worried about importing uh, impending import controls. Will the Minister meet with me and business leaders in North Shropshire to understand how they can continue their businesses with these problematic controls imminent? Well, Mr. Speaker, of course I'm happy to meet with her, but I would remind her, in terms of the answers I gave earlier, that the border operating model. Uh, was introduced after very extensive consultation with businesses, in particular led by DEFRA with the agri-food sector. So there has been plenty of opportunity for feedback from businesses on this, but of course I am happy to meet with her on our specific cases. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am sure the Minister will share my desire to revitalise our fantastic local high streets, and Flitwick Town Council have a plan to do exactly that, but they need support from the UK Community Ownership Fund. Will the Minister urge the Secretary of State to look favourably on their forthcoming application? Uh, I thank my honourable friend for his question. It's good to see him working hard for his community. Uh, the Community Ownership Fund sits with the Department for Leveling Up, and I'm sure that if he makes his representations to them, they will be able to provide him with a more substantive answer. Final short question, Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, will the Secretary of State look at the impact assessments of universities where, where uh, the traditional universities are failing to meet the standards of sustainable development research, and Manchester and uh, Huddersfield uh, and Newcastle are doing much better? Will she look at that and push the other universities to do better? Uh, 
This is, uh, th 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 uh, well, this is a battle that sits with DfE. Of course, my department takes an interest in all of the innovation uh, research that is going on because it will help boost the UK economy. And I am sure the DBT officials have been looking at those assessments. And uh, we can provide further detail if he has a more specific question. That completes those questions. We now come on to business questions. I call the Chandelier of the House, Lucy.